snake feeding, but I have a special guest today who's going to be talking about condors. And before he gets started, um, just want to go over Headwater Science Center. We're open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday. It is 9.30 to 5. Sunday, it is 1 to 5. Um, we require masks upon entry. Uh, and generally, again, it's cold out. Please stay safe. So today, uh, I asked a friend of mine who has worked with these animals in the past uh, to come talk about condors because they're an interesting bird that we don't have out here. And it's something that we're going to be covering similar animals in the prehistoric animal live streams coming up soon in the next few weeks. So I figured these would be a good animal to, for people to have sort of a good handle on what they're like. Um, so I'm going to introduce my friend. So Isaac, do you want to hop on in here? Isaac and I uh, used to volunteer at the Oakland Zoo together. And yeah, he has been working in wildlife for the past year and a half. Uh, cool. I guess four years, depending on how you count. <laughs> yeah, all um, Yeah, I worked with California condors at three different national parks. Um, and uh, condors, there's two species. There's Andean condors, and then there's California condors. What I'll be talking about today, which I have personal experience with, is California condors. Um, condors are a large raptor large bird of prey um you can see up here they can have a wingspan of up to nine and a half feet um this is one with a slightly less than nine and a half foot wingspan in comparison would be like the bald eagles you would see here um they can be about three and a half feet tall so if one was just standing right next to me on the ground would be about this high um comparatively a bald eagle would be about here just peeking over the table um they're uh very large birds they got i got a little toy one right here you can see um overall um almost like jet black except for they have these white underwing patches and a little bit of white on the back of their wings um they're scavengers they m spend most of their time just kind of soaring over the landscape um they can normally fly at roughly 30 miles an hour but they can go up to 55 miles an hour if they get a good wind behind them um they are found in california um utah baja california um and Arizona. Um, they used to be found all across the United States back in the late Pleistocene uh, 40,000 years ago and since then their range has contracted but there's been fossil evidence found of them in New York and Florida and uh, back in the 1800s people were still seeing them up in British Columbia and Canada and Lewis and Clark have um, a record, like uh, notes about seeing one and shooting it at the mouth of the Columbia River in Washington. So they're they've they've gone undergone a range contraction, but I'll talk about that later. Um, their diet is pretty much they solely scavenge. Um, there's a couple of Re records of them maybe eating uh, eggs and baby seabirds from offshore islands, but besides that, they mainly just scavenge off of dead animals. Um, the interior birds, like in Arizona, Utah, will mostly eat dead elk, dead cattle, dead sheep, dead bighorn sheep, just just about anything that's larger than a deer. And sometimes they've been found on like just a rabbit carcass, but normally that gets picked over before they get there. Um, and then on the coast, they're often eat washed up dead sea life. So like California sea lions, stellar sea lions, gray whales, humpback whales that wash up, sometimes very large salmon. Um, they, the, the coastal ones, uh, like kind of have a slightly different um, life history than the interior ones. They tend to stay on the coast. They, um, a lot of them, instead of nest, 
so all the interior ones nest on cliffs, uh, cliff sides up to 600 feet and uh, 6,000 feet in altitude. So like the Grand Canyon, um, Zion National Park, up on the really high sandstone cliff sides they'll nest. And then more into California, it'll be more like rocky terrain. And then I'll, some of the coastal ones, and especially back when they were up in Northern California going up into Washington, British Columbia, they would nest in very large trees that you they think it was just if the top was broken off so there's like a little bit of flat area they would nest in the flat areas there's only one um condor that currently nests in a california redwood tree near big sur area um the they are scavengers so scavenging and they'll they'll eat up to about two to three pounds of meat in a day um they can potentially go for i've personally been around for we had a condor that didn't eat for two weeks after eating a large meal but he's kind of a weird exception um but they will sometimes if they have a big meal it really weighs them down there since they are birds even though they are absolutely massive they only weigh up to about 25 pounds and if a 20 pound bird gains three pounds in weight in just one sitting from eating it it doesn't really want to move around fly around very much so they'll they'll sometimes just kind of hang out in an area after they eat or like since they don't really care about how fresh the carcass is they'll hang around for three four days like eat a little bit fly up in a tree hang out for the rest of the day next day come back down eat a little bit more uh they have bare heads like most vultures do um they this is beneficial for sticking their head in carcasses um since they generally live in hot sunny areas any like blood or guts or anything that are stuck to their head will just kind of dry up and flake off um it helps keep them sanitary when they're digging their heads in very unsanitary places um their head skin also it it ranges from like a pink to a red to a yellow orange um and it will change depending on emotion when they're mad it'll get very brightly colored or like if they're trying to impress a mate they'll like kind of change the colors and they also have um, you can see on this model kind of a uh, little bit of exposed skin right here. It's called their crop. It gets large when they've fed recently. They kind of store food there for later. Um, and also they can like puff it up when they're trying to show some sort of emotion, whether they're mad or trying to attract a mate. And it also will change color with their head. Um, so they can really show their emotions through their head and prop while they also act for feeding purposes. Um, they, they are currently an endangered animal. There's very few of them left on earth. Um, so when you work with them, you got like, we, we have a good idea of their personality a lot more like individual animals getting to know them than what would normally be with most wildlife species. And we've come to learn how human almost they are, like for a lack of a better word, um, how individual they are. Um, they mate for life, usually. Um, sometimes they'll have divorces. Sometimes they'll have like a marital tiff and will just go their separate ways and then come back like two years later. Um, <laughs> there's <laughs> all sorts of various interesting stories with condor relationships. It's, it's kind of like a reality TV show um, for all the condor biologists. Like, Oh, these two are not hanging out together. And like, even with the like married couples they'll there's great diversity in what they'll do like there's two birds that i worked with that 
all year round they would hang out together you would always see them flying together there would be one and then you're like oh that's strange it's only one of them and then the female comes in it's like oh there there's both of them and they would like feed their chicks like longer than they most birds would they were very caring parents whereas there's two others that we were working with they would they only hung out together when they had a kid um and they didn't really seem to like to hang out e with each other very much then um they'll rotate who takes care of the kid when the kid is in the nest um condors they they lay their eggs they'll lay one egg um each year um maximum they'll they'll lay a second one if the egg gets like eaten or destroyed very early on in their nesting season but um so they'll lay their eggs usually around like march um getting into um april um very late ones sometimes into may but that's pretty unusual and then the eggs um will hatch usually around may to june and then their chick will be in the nest from when it hatches to usually about late november is when kind of fully out of the nest they begin to learn to fly like around october um but they early on it, it takes them a while to get the hang of it um they'll just initially just kind of jump out of the nest and hope for the best <laughs> um but they they kind of get the hang of it over until about november and then by then they're they'll be hanging outside the nest um and they can start to maybe take care of themselves but they're not fully independent until about march or into into like the summer of the next year when they're fully on their own so it's it's a two-year commitment for the um mated pair to kind of take care of and feed their baby um and uh they're it it's very interesting seeing all the personalities they'll have um as being a long-lived species they don't breed very quickly so it's one egg per i like best case scenario two birds they'll have a baby every other year but oftentimes things happen um and it it will be closer to like uh, a successful child every five years maybe um some some do a lot better some do worse um so, uh, question. Um, what, wasn't there recently the condors are up to a thousand? Um, so there, they, there was recently the thousandth condor born since, um, their rehabilitation program started in the eighties, which I guess I'll touch on now. Um, they, in the 1800s into the 1900s, they started declining as um americans moved west um they were often shot as being seen like oh it's a threat to my livestock even though they were only scavengers people would see them on the carcasses of their dead cows and make incorrect assumptions they were also sometimes killed when people would poison carcasses and attempt to kill wolves and bears the condors would come down and feed off the dead carcass that has been poisoned and die from poisoning um so we we we're not exactly sure how far west they got um when pioneers were kind of making their all right sorry how far east they got when pioneers were making their way west um but they kind of slowly retracted their range all the way um their lowest point was in 1982 um it was kind of like okay there is next to none left there's probably about 27 left in the wild um and it was kind of like okay these birds are about to go extinct but we want to do our best to prevent that so just kind of a gamble they decided to take 
all the birds they could back into captivity. Um, that was about a five-year effort, and in 1987, they um, managed to capture 20, all, all the wild condors they could, which was 22 individuals, um, uh, and they brought them into captivity, and they tried to start breeding them in captivity. Um, there's probably a couple left that they didn't catch, but they probably died off not too long after. Um, so the next 10-ish years, they were pretty much trying to figure out the breeding program for them. At first, they tried to use related um, condor species, the Andean condor, to raise the chicks. But the Andean condors are kind of tough on the chicks. They're pretty harsh parents, and a lot of the con California condor chicks didn't survive that. And what they ended up doing was um splitting the the like since they'll lay a second egg if the first egg dies um or they would take the first egg away from the pair um and then they would hand raise that egg with condor puppets um <laughs> they it's i don't have a photo of it but it's 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 like a well molded puppet that really looks like a condor head and they would like feed the babies like that and then once they got big enough to be learning how to fly they would stick them with the rest of the condors and then the second egg they would have the actual parents raise and this was able they were able to double the reproduction rate this way so once they kind of got that ball rolling in the late 90s they started re releasing the first condors back into the wild um in central california um, Baja, California, and Mexico, and um, Grand Canyon area uh, in Arizona. Um, and from, from their original 22 birds, um, the current population of 2020, um, we don't have the 2021 results yet of who's all still alive, but um, there was 504 total birds in existence 268 were in the wild and 167 were in breeding programs or just in zoos as display animals um the ideal ideally we want way more birds but um they're they've still been having challenges with uh lead poisoning from uh from hunters just micro fragments of lead bullets being left in gut piles left behind um and the condors will eat the gut pile or whatever parts are left by um hunters or if it's like people shooting wild pigs it uh, there's a few different sources of lead but um they they can't digest the lead fragments and the only way they can't pass it through their body because it's too large um the only real way to get rid of it is if they were to vomit it up but the condors don't know what's slowly poisoning them and like a, a lead fragment like smaller than you can actually see is enough to kill an adult condor um they it will just get in their system slowly dissolve and it causes them to just kind of become really slow and tired all the time until they either die of a stroke or just they they can't eat because they're just so tired from the lead poisoning um it's a really slow and sad way to go sadly and that's pretty much the only thing that is holding them back at this point um it's it's pretty sad because about 10 percent of the wild population dies of lead poisoning each a few other causes like the sometimes they'll just have an accident and crash into something sometimes they'll power lines are a little bit of an issue since they're such a large bird if they fly into like the smaller power lines they can complete the circuit between the two wires running on top and get fried which 
again, is a pretty sad way to go. Um, but mostly it's due to lead poisoning. They're just not able to rise. Uh, they're, they're breeding slightly faster than they are dying from lead poisoning. And since they, they're a large bird, they are a very long-lived bird, naturally. Um, we believe they can probably reach a lifespan of 60 years plus. Um, that is yet to happen since the 80s. The oldest bird that we know of is, like, early 40s. Um, and they don't reach the ability to breed until... They're three years old, sorry, five years old, and they're not, no, three years old, and they're not really going to actually be able to breed until they're about five. That's when they are starting to look better, and females are like, okay, you're not, you're not too ugly. Um, but they'll, lead poisoning can kind of strike at any time, and when a bird, it, like, they, they, can't really they don't really know what's happening to them so they can't like learn from previous mistakes sadly and so they'll they'll be birds that are 30 years old that will just just kind of roll the dice and get bad luck and um wind up dead from lead poisoning or it'll be a one-year-old chick and when some they're they're live for so long so they normally would have a long period to have more children expand the population but oftentimes that doesn't happen and sadly there i mentioned before there's divorce among condors but often there's more likely there's going to be widowing um but are there still captive breeding programs running actively yes there's um five i believe um and that's really helping their population and they are still in like on an increase um in the it, breeding and it, in the wild they're starting to be able to breed more and more the first uh condor pair breed bred in um uh utah in first time in at least a hundred years there was a wild condor born in utah um, so they're, they're starting, they're slowly making a comeback, but they still have a long ways to go. And what are some ways that we, we could help with the lead poisoning? Would that be something like switching over to copper ammunition? Yes, um, non-lead alternatives, copper, tungsten, um, for at least when you are actually actively hunting in condor territory. And it's beneficial for all animals. Um, Lead, lead poisoning is something that pretty much everyone would do better avoiding. And that's something that doesn't not affect us, too. That's something that shooting with lead and stuff, because that's going to accumulate in like, stuff like fish meat. It, it, it can, and also in hunted meat itself. Because it'll, it'll just be tiny little fragments from the bullet impacting and spreading the impact, um, where it just kind of mushrooms out and just tiny little pieces that you can't even see they just kind of build up over time luckily humans we can actually pass those through our digestive system but for a lot of wildlife it is kind of a like a sneaking issue um anything else about uh, california condors that you think is important you know, like you said they weighed like what, 25 pounds um max 25 pounds um usually about like 18 to 30 the males I'm sorry 18 to 20 um the males are larger than the females which is unusual for most raptors like uh bald eagles that we have around here the females are going to be noticeably larger than the males whereas california condors the males will be noticeably larger than the females uh, so what's up that you do with condors when you were working around uh, what's some of like maybe favorite things you did um so something that i've done for the most part is kind of just tracking them um since they are an endangered bird and there's so few of them we can actually keep tabs on what each one is up to roughly each day and like if there's like a certain amount of time we're like oh we haven't got any records of this bird like we can both visually 
um, search for them, and they all have radio transmitters that we have antennas that we can pick up the signal from and tell which direction they are. And if a bird just kind of stays in one spot for too, for too long or just kind of drops off the radar, we can know, okay, this particular bird, we got to keep an eye out for, we'll look for more, we'll go to their last known location, try and track down where they went. Because... There's such each bird is such a valuable resource. Uh, so another thing with these condors, wasn't there a recent um, non sexually reproducing like reproduction where like a female bird just kind of laid an egg? So that that was actually back in I believe the mid '90s. Um, it was in a captive breeding program. Um, and condor laid an egg no one really thought anything of it and but it's such a small population that someone was doing a genetic test of all the birds like oh let's see who's related to who like we're, we have like visual evidence of who's related to who but sometimes sneaky things happen and they came across an instance where the condor if i remember right didn't have genetic material from any father it was just kind of like huh laid an egg we didn't think of anything of the time but there was she shouldn't have been able to lay an egg and i mean, as far as can tell they certain animals it's what's known as parthenogenesis where um female animals can just kind of clone themselves into a child and is that common among birds, or is that a relatively rare? It is very uncommon of, among birds, as far as we know. So this could be a thing in the next few years. We might find out that a lot of animals that we don't think could be potentially can. Possibly, it's it's something that is very hard to know unless you have the genetic material for every single individual in the population, which we do with condors. Um, it's like kind of an ideal test. I believe the only other known instances of it was in turkeys and that's another animal that it was domestic turkeys so it was a big farm that had a bunch of turkeys and they had the genetic information for all the turkeys and it was like huh some of these just they're they, they don't have a dad <laughs> like some of them are they would be basically genetically the same um yeah they there can be slight changes in their genetic information but it's like there's no added information and this is something we're part of genesis is this sometimes a uh, species like response to high pressure on the population certain species yes in high stress situations so most of the like more well-known examples are in reptiles and it will be when there's like the population is very spread out fragmented and there's just like a female that's been alone for a couple of years and just something will kick in biologically because they haven't had a chance to breed for a certain amount of time they'll just lay eggs, lay eggs <laughs> that are fertile solely from themselves so you mentioned with these the andean condor being somewhat harsh Parents? Mm -hmm. Are they as harsh on their own chicks as well? Or? Uh, yeah, it's it. It's a species. Difference. Yeah, it's it's just kind of a species difference. <laughs> and does that impact the Andean condor at all? Um, large, not are the chicks also a little bit more like. Yeah, their their chicks are a little bit larger. Andean condors can have a wingspan of up to eleven feet. So um, it's like a full like you're not even on the board. Uh, like yeah, with the half wingspan, I think it would be to about here. Um. It, they're a slightly larger bird, and they got they grow up differently. <laughs> uh, any last things you want to add on this, or are you, are you relatively satisfied with what you uh, said? Today? Yeah, I can't think of anything particularly to add. Um, uh, so this has been, I guess, a total different subject, but on the subject of like volunteering and stuff, because you and I met through volunteering at the Oakland Zoo. Uh, for anyone who's like in high school or middle school, um, would you recommend volunteering in places like this if you're interested in this sort of stuff? Definitely. Um, it's like, personally, I love volunteering and it's, it's experience will always trump 
whatever else you have. Um, like having like seven years of education. Yeah. For, in your case, what, like 10 years or, of education um, experience yeah. at the zoo is better than like, honestly, like a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Like it, and it both, it both like makes you look better and also it gives you confidence to be like, yes, I know what I'm doing. Once you've actually done it in the field, I spent a lot of time volunteering when I was um, going through school to uh, for wildlife biology. Um, I volunteered with a bunch of programs. That's how I got my first experience with condors was through volunteering. And then I got a slightly better volunteering experience. And then once I graduated, I had the experience to apply for a job with California condors. And that job led directly into another job with California condors, which led me into my current job, which is completely different, but also wildlife. And then also just for general things, like you meet like a lot of people, like we, I think a some chunk of our longest running friends we work with at the zoo. It's great for networking, especially if you're in a kind of small field like wildlife biology, you are at best like three degrees of separation from someone and just just knowing someone and you're like you'll just be talking with them like and they'll be like oh yeah like i know that person like i can get you in contact it's 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 a very small world <laughs> very similar to the museum thing you know one person and it's just like you're not even seven degrees or six degrees like yeah point um and then like yeah our old uh, supervisors from the Oakland Zoo are great references as well for mm -hmm. looking for not even just jobs and other volunteering opportunities. Like, it's great for building up references, like having a reference from actual work, like having school related references is great from a professor, but having a reference from someone that you have worked for has seen your abilities in the field is great. Uh, in case we have any uh, BSU students, uh, this is why you should probably join the Wildlife Society and probably try to get in your foot in the door with like duck banding, deer check stations, the opportunities that all of our professors basically tell us every week at least. So like, hey, you should do this. Um, the reason to do that stuff. Uh, but yeah, this has been a much longer live stream than normal. Uh, the next live stream for me will be a normal prehistoric animal one. And we might have other guests in the future on our live streams. So keep